Welcome to the Reality Revolution. Today we're going to read a fantastic Neville Goddard lecture. This one delivered on June 16th, 1969. This one has two different names. The I in Me is God Himself in the Return to Glory edition and it is called All That Is Divine in the 300 Lectures let us go into the silence edition. Here Neville once again returns to a discussion of the I am, something we've been talking a lot about on the podcast and growing in understanding of this simple yet powerful concept. In the nature of things, it is impossible for any child born of woman to go unredeemed. When I say I am, I am proclaiming all that is divine in my flesh. How then can God cast away that which is the I in me, the I that constitutes me? You will be casting away himself as useless, and that is impossible. Does it teach this in Scripture? Yes, it does. All the little statements in Scripture, all the little stories are parables. The life of Christ is a parable. We must distinguish between the story as it is told and the message that it intends to tell. So we are told in the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, and calling on a child, he put him into the midst of them. See that no one despises these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven always they behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 18, 1, 10. They never deviate. They're always beholding the face of my Father who is in heaven. It is said in certain manuscripts that they are angels beholding. Well, we must see what the word angel means and what the word child means. So he calls a child. The word translated child means an infant. It also means a term of endearment. The word translated angel means a messenger. It also means to bring forth. So here is a child that is always beholding the face of my Father, who is in heaven, and he's bringing forth a message. We become what we behold. The reality of man is symbolized in that of the Christ child, the incorruptible seed that is always beholding the face of the Father, molding this into a Father's image so that he may become one with the Father. So he casts the shadow into a certain role, and we judge the role. Yet, that innocent child molding itself into the image of the Father is casting a shadow of itself into this world as a part that we are playing. And I say, I am rich, I am poor, I am known, I am unknown. And here, the innocent little child, the Christ child, this incorruptible seed beholding the face of the perfect one is molding itself into the image of that which it beholds. Having seen it clearly, it is my desire constantly to see so clearly, to see what clearly? To see the truth, to see it truly, that I may become an image of truth and share it with everyone in the world who will accept it. For the whole vast picture that you see in the world that frightens you, that is horrible. And men who do not understand it tell you that you are damned, that you are not saved. Nonsense. It is not possible for any child born of woman not to be redeemed. It can't be done. For the being that is the reality of you has never left the face of the Father, molding himself into the image of what he beholds, and he becomes what he beholds, but he casts it into the world. It takes at this moment the part of the rich man as he molds it, the part of the poor man, the part of this, but still allowing all the freedom in this world by another precept. Whatever you desire, believe you have it, and you will. Mark eleven twenty four. He allows that freedom, which is a fantastic freedom in this world, but he's always molding and molding himself into the image of what he is beholding, and he's only beholding the face of my Father. My Father is your Father, and my God is your God. Eventually molding myself into the face of my Father, I am He. This is the picture of the entire world in which we live. 
It seems fantastic, but it's true. I am telling you what I know. Not what I'm theorizing. Not what I'm speculating. That no one can fail. No one being in the world can fail. Hitler can't fail. Stalin can't fail. The story is told us all through scripture that he hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Who hardened it? The Lord God Almighty hardened it and made him to not let his people go. And then he gave him the blow after blow after blow. And then he hardened it again. Therefore, who was responsible? In the story of Job, who played the part but the child within? I had heard of thee with the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see thee. 42.5 I now see why I went through with hell, and then was given a hundred times more than he had before. He brought him out as the perfect one. Well, you are being brought out as the perfect one. So you play a certain role now, and you played unnumbered roles in the past. Here, in this gathering, you haven't very many roles to play. Many of you are playing the last. You haven't many more to play while you are here. But you played unnumbered roles. Each role was for a perfect reason to get you into the image of that which it was beholding. And so I am beholding the image, always hopeful that I would not deviate from that perfect image so that I may become an image of the perfect one, of the truth. Now he tells you, you will abide in my word. If you abide in my word, you will know the truth. But he said, Who is the truth? I am the truth. John 14, 6. And then you'll be set free. But who will set me free? The Son. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. John 8, 36. And then you will know the truth, and I am the truth. I will set you free. The minute you meet me, you'll be set free. So you are molding your own face into the image of what you're beholding. You don't see it now. You see the shadow world, the whole vast shadow world, and you are carried away with it. But believe me, and then come back time and time again and lean against this vision in your moments of distress. Just lean against it. It will support you. For I am not theorizing. I am not speculating. I am telling you what I know. The little child, as we are told in the eighth chapter of Proverbs, in the very beginning, when he created the universe, I was beside him as a little child. I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always. He who finds me, finds life. He who misses me, injures himself. He who hates me, loves death. Proverbs 8.29-39 There are those who can't stand this thought, and they are in love with this world, and this is the world of death. So here, in this world of ours, we start with I am. That's God. That is consciousness. When I begin to view consciousness, I must see the two relationships. First, being pure being, unconditioned I am. Then conditioned being, well, I'm a man now, Neville, a speaker, a teacher. Another one is a banker. Another one is a thief. Another one is something else. And these are the conditioned states of being. But there are two, and I must not confuse them. A state of being is simply I am. And then conditioned being, all of this is conditioned being. I do not care what part you are playing, the little child, which is only a symbol of the being that you really are, who you never see here, is casting you into that role, and you are playing that part perfectly. You do not see the little child until the end. Now the thing called child in that statement that I quoted in the beginning and calling to him a child, he put him into the midst of them. The word child means a term of endearment, but also an infant. The day will come you will hold that infant and you will express the most endearing feeling towards it and it will come forward in speech. In my own case, I said, how is my sweetheart? Holding the infant in my hands, I had this impulse and I could not resist it. And I said, How is my sweetheart? In keeping with the statement, and he called a little child, and you placed him in the midst of them. Then when you find the child, you find life. He who finds me, the little child that was beside him, when he created the world, finds life. He who misses me injures himself, and he who hates me hates the very thought of it, loves death. 
He's in love with the world of death, and everything here is mortality. Every condition in the world is mortal. The billionaire leaves it behind him. The one with all the medals in his world pinned upon him leaves that behind him, and the tunic itself upon which they are pinned will decay. The medals will decay, and they'll all vanish. But he cannot vanish. The little child within him that was one with God and is God is changing the image as he watches it. He watches the image, and he has to be as perfect as his Father in heaven is perfect. So he is building the same image, and when it reflects it and radiates it, you find him. You find him, and you hold him. And as you hold him, you come forward with a statement, a term of endearment. And in my own case, how is my sweetheart? And the whole thing vanished. The child was but a sign, a sign of my own being that was casting myself into these roles. So I cast myself into the role of a poor boy in a poor family, unknown, having no background whatsoever, no social, financial, intellectual, but no background. That was the role into which the little child within me, which is my being, cast me. This was the end of the entire journey. He cast me into that role. Then he brought me out into his perfect image, which was the image of the Father. And then the Father unveiled himself as my own being. And that is the story of everyone in this world. But he does give me a cushion and tells me that by a precept, as I walk the earth, Though you go through hell, take this precept and apply it. When you are against the eight ball, when you are up against it, apply it. How do I apply it? Know what you want. First of all, you must know what you want and then assume that you have it. You must assume that to the same extent that I am assuming, that I am seeing and I am what I am beholding, for man becomes what he beholds. I must behold myself secure if that is what I want. I must behold myself healthy if that is what I want. I must behold myself known if that is what I want. I must see it actually as he in me is seeing the face of the Father. He never deviates from that, but he casts his shadow, allowing his shadow to apply it in this world. So everyone here is as free as the wind if you know who you really are. No matter what you've gone through, and you've gone through hell, and what you are going through, and what you may go through, you must be redeemed. For he in you will not falter, and he's always watching the face of the Father. Not for one moment has he changed it. So here in the world, as Blake said so beautifully, that it doesn't really matter. You will see from what I teach, said he that I do not consider either the just or the wicked to be in a supreme state, but to be every one of them states of the sleep into which the soul may fall in its deadly dreams of good and evil when it left paradise following the serpent. The symbol that you will not really die. God said that you would die? I tell you, you will not really die, but you will become like God, knowing good and evil. Genesis 3.4 so we come into the world eating of the tree of good and evil, and we judge one another. This one is bad, and that one is good, and we go through life this way. But now see behind the mask, the one that really is there. It doesn't matter what he's doing, and it doesn't matter what his little plan in this world is. So he wants to plot and plan to get the better of you. Leave him alone. Leave him alone and let him do exactly what he is planning. But in your own mind's eye, you apply this principle and assume that you are as free as the wind from all encroachments, knowing in the depth of your own soul you are seeing the face of the Father. When you see him at first, you don't know he's a father. A child knows its parents before it knows that it knows its parents. You'll meet God and know God before you know God is Father. You'll know the Father before you know the Father is yourself. For this is how consciousness awakes in the world. So the Son comes into the world to save those who are lost. So what? I am lost only by wandering consciousness. I wandered from the state, that's all. I'm not lost. When I say I am, 
I am in, I am of, and I'm moving towards the I am. How could I move towards the I am when I am in him and I'm of him? I could only move in awakening, moving in consciousness, moving towards the awakening as that I am. So everyone is moving towards that I am. But when he says I am, he is in it. He is of it and he is moving towards it. He's only moving in consciousness. So his only loss is simply a wandering consciousness. And everything appeals to me to wander away from the I am. Believe in this. This is going to help you. Believe in that man. He is rich. Believe in that one. He is known. Believe in this. And everyone is trying to move me away from what I really am. It doesn't really matter. I can't be lost. But the Son of Man comes. Who is the Son of Man? The Son of Man is the one in whom the ideal was realized, called in scripture Jesus, but Jesus represents. He's only the personification of all in whom the incorruptible seed awoke. It budded, it flowered, and then it simply came into fruitage. And the one in whom it brings in the fruit, that one is Jesus. Jesus is the personification of the ideal that is housed in man. David is the personification of the whole of humanity reduced into a single being and projected as he is personified, that is David. And I'm coming towards fatherhood. I can't be a father unless there is a son, and that is David. Now last lecture night, I had hoped that I'd told it as clearly as I could, and I think I did to the best of my ability. I got two phone calls, and they were thrilling to hear because they got more than ever before, but they were outweighed by other numbers who never understood it at all. And they told me, I just couldn't get you at all. Either you are beyond my head or it is something that is new to me. Well, they come, not regularly, but they come. So I asked them to go home and simply dwell upon it. In essence, it was this. It's very simple. That in scripture, the expression Christ is used of the human race viewed ideally. It is also used of the one member of that race who had achieved the ideal. The human race and all of its generations, all of its experiences condensed into a single being and projected, personified. It would come out as the eternal youth David. That is the whole of humanity condensed into a single being and then projected is David. Now, the being in whom the ideal is completely realized is projected and is called Jesus. He is the Father. He is God the Father. You can't be a father unless there is a son. David is the son. So everyone in whom the ideal is attained is Jesus. There is only Jesus in the end. There is only God the Father. There is only one body, one spirit, one Lord, one God, and Father of all. Ephesians 4.4 4. So everyone who actually attains the ideal will be confronted with the son bearing witness to the fact he is God the Father, for David is the son of all the generations of men, and the experience is fused into a single being and then personified. That's the eternal youth that is David. I'm telling you what I know. I'm not speculating. That is a fact. It may not be the easiest thing to grasp, but you dwell upon it. Lean upon it in times of trouble. That's what Paul really meant when he said he was not unmindful of it. And he never doubted for one moment this vision, this heavenly vision, which was the promise of God to the fathers. But he didn't spell it out. I am trying my best to spell it out to everyone in the world who will listen to me. Those who will not listen to me now, let them read it after I am gone in what I have left behind me in the written form, that the son of the whole vast world of humanity and all that it has ever experienced, put it all together and bring it into one being and then put it out and you'll see how beautiful it is that all the horrors of today that you and I will condemn on this level when the end comes it took all these horrors to produce David so in the end you'll say father forgive them because they know not what they do Luke 23 34 on this level we are judging this man 
that woman and judging every being in the world in the most horrible manner. And yet it takes all these parts to produce David. And in the end, when David is brought forth and you look at him and he calls you father, you are God the Father and that is Jesus. So that's what I tried to bring out the last lecture night. Tonight will help those who found it difficult the first time. There is in you. But now this is a mystery he calls a child. He calls it an infant. How could I call an infant? And then he takes the infant and he puts the infant in the midst of them. Now he tells you, let no one despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always behold the face of my Father who is in heaven, Matthew 18.10. And man invariably becomes what he beholds. I can take anyone in this world, and if I represent him to myself as the man, the woman, I would like him to be, and if I do not waver in that representation, he will conform to it. I want someone to be big in my world, then make him big in my mind first, and treat him that way morning, noon, and night, and see him as that being, and he cannot fail. I'll bring him into that picture regardless if I do not fail, because I must become what I behold. I'll bring him right into it. But we waver. We hear rumors that he did this or she did that. And then we change the picture. Don't change the picture. I'll go back and show you these silly little things in our world today. Many years ago, I read the story of famous theatrical mothers and their sons that had no talent to begin with. One was Milton Berle and his mother. She would go out. He wasn't the only child she had, but she singled him out. She would go out when they were playing ball and she would say to all the boys who were playing baseball, Milton is a star and he has to be a star and you must all play around him. Whatever Milton says goes and she meant it. If you don't like this, we'll take away the ball and take away the bat. There'll be no game. I could go through a list of dozen in this story where every mother of these fellows who became stars held that ideal of their son in their mind's eye and did not falter for one moment. If the mother didn't when they couldn't, because they become what she's beholding. When a mother compares me to a neighborhood child and finds me wanting, well, then she has completely broken the image. She sees me less than the neighborhood child, and she thinks that's the way to get me to be spurred to make a greater effort. That's not the thing at all. If she really wanted me to be great, then do not falter in her image of me. Don't try to make me do it. If she really wants that for me, do it. Well, now there's something in you that has never left the face of the Father. Not in eternity. Will it leave it until you are perfect? So it casts a shadow, and now you must play the part of a bum. For it's necessary to bring this image into focus. Now you play the part of something else. And it casts all these images, and here we are in the flesh. But what is the reality in the flesh? When I say I, I am proclaiming that which is divine in the flesh. That is my divine being, and it cannot be cast off unless God is willing to lose himself, for the I in me is God, the I in you. That's God. So when I say I am, that's he. That's his name. So it cannot, not in eternity could it, fail to achieve the predetermined goal, which is to fashion itself into the image of the Father, and eventually to become the Father. What a mystery. But here the whole thing was done before that, the world was. You are predestined to become the author of the entire world, the one who wrote the play and who is playing it, and the one who supports it and sustains it. That is the God of our scripture. That is the Lord God Jehovah. That is the Lord Jesus. You have done all the horrible things in the world of which you have certain memories, and you are Jesus. Yes, you are destined to be Jesus. When the image is perfect, you will awaken and you are the Lord Jesus. Well, the Lord Jesus is God the Father, and if he is God the Father, there must be a Son, and the Son is humanity. But humanity gathered together into a single being and projected is David, and that is the mystery. When you come to the end, you awaken as God the Father. What is the next play? I do not know. I only know that until everyone is awakened, it isn't complete, so we don't criticize, we don't condemn. Because from above we will aid every being in this world to come back. So we are the ones called those who came to save the lost. To first seek him and then to save him. Save what? We bring him back. That wandering consciousness 
we bring it back to the vision of the Father. Now my one consuming desire is to simply see truly. In seeing truly, then I become an image of truth. And then I can tell it just as it happened to me. Instead of going out and trying to make you feel you must make a greater effort in some moral cause, or this cause, or the other cause, no. I'm not asking you not to give to charity if you have money. Not to do the lovely things in this world. Do all the things you want to do. But that is not what will save you at all. There's something in you that is focused on the face of the Eternal Father. And He's becoming what He is beholding. So as He actually sees it, He casts a shadow. It needs now this experience in poverty, this experience in wealth, this experience. But He gives to each one that cushion. While I am actually forming the image of my Father, which is my being, I am now allowing my shadow world to apply a certain principle. Whatever you desire, believe you have received it, and you will. Mark 11.24 So though I cast myself in the role of the poor one, I am not going to anchor myself there. He may become rich. I cast myself in the role of the rich one, need not remain there. He could become poor as he wanders from the thing into which I have cast him. I am molding my image. So I am telling you this wonderful story. It's a simple little story. And you read these scholars as they write it, like one I read it today. And the little child was brought. And they wonder who the little child was and whatever became of that little child. They see it as a secular story and it hasn't a thing to do with anything that took place in this world. Jesus is not a man of secular history. Jesus is the representative of every man and woman in this world who attained within themselves the ideal that incorruptible seed blossomed and then bore fruit within them. The fruit I have marked out time and time again for you. I need not go over it again. You know exactly what I mean when I speak of the fruit. These are the signs within you. The resurrection, the birth, the discovery of the fatherhood, and all these things take place within you. That's the fruit that you are bearing. There's not a thing in this world that's comparable to it. If tonight you were the biggest in this world, you had all the money in the world, you have everything in the world, what would it matter if this that I am telling you were not true. And who knows who will call you this night. But if I tell you as I am and what I'm telling you is the truth, you are an immortal being and you cannot die. Dead through the body seems you cannot die for the reality of you is I am and that is God. There is no other God. There never was another God. There never will be another God. You are awakening slowly to the realization that I am God, who did the entire thing in this world. Not one will be greater than the other. In this world, we all try to be better than the other. Let me sit at your right hand, Lord. Let me do so and so. All will simply awaken and all will be one. For there is only one Son and one Father. And if I am the Father of that one Son, and you are the Father of that Son, you and I are one. Now we understand the great Shema. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Deuteronomy 6, 4. If He's one and He's the Father, then He can't be two. But if He's a Father, there must be a Son. And there is a Son, and the Son is David. That son bears witness of my fatherhood. But if you have the identical experience and you are the father and the same son calls you father, are we not one? So in the end, there is only one God, one father, one son. So the one fell into division into this completely scattered, divided state. In the end, we all awake and we are the father. Yet without loss of identity, I will love you dearly as a seeming other and yet knowing that we are one. It's a peculiar mystery, but we are one in the end. There is no other being, only God. But God is a Father, and that's the last revelation of God when He reveals Himself as Father. 
He first reveals himself as power, almighty power, and it's a man that describes power, real power. Then he reveals himself one after the other. In the end, he reveals himself as infinite love, and that is Father. So why are we here? Blake put it beautifully. We are put on earth a little space that we may learn to bear the beams of love. Songs of Innocence You could not stand the beams of love in your present state. You couldn't stand it. So we are put on earth a little space that we may learn to bear the beams of love because God is infinite love and it's power, sheer power. We speak of power today like going to the moon and contemplating going to Mars and Venus. Well, that is little firecrackers compared to the being that brought the whole universe into being and sustains it. And you are that being. It's impossible to get it over on a certain level. How could you be the being that brought the world into what we call the universe and you are that being? Here we are in this world fighting each other. And yet that is also part of the play. So in the end, everyone, but everyone, will awake. I do not care what a man has ever done in this world. Put yourself now in the part of a father and your son is now accused of the most horrible, monstrous act in the world. But you are a father and you love that son. Wouldn't you want him to go free? I know I would. I wouldn't care what he did. He's my son. If he is my son and I love him, I wouldn't care what he did. I would regret that he did it. But he is my son. So in the story of David, David did every conceivable horror in the world, but he was God's son. If you read the story of David, that wasn't a thing that man could do that he didn't do never lost a battle. He won every battle into which he went. He sent Uriah into battle knowing he would be killed to get Bathsheba. All right, so he stole the man's wife. Although he had a thousand wives of his own, he wanted one more. Yet he was called the perfect man. I have found in David a man after my own heart who will do all my will, Acts 13.22. And who is he? He is the Lord's son. David is the Lord's son, Psalms 2.7. But David is not a little man born of a woman. You must take all the generations of men and all of their experiences and fuse them into a single being and personify that being and it comes out as an eternal youth beautifully beyond the wildest dreams of man and it is David. Now the world will say no, that it's Jesus Christ who is the Son. You don't understand the mystery. Jesus is the Lord. That is the mystery for David in the Spirit calls him Father. David calls him Lord. So humanity is the Son. Humanity is the Christ viewed ideally, and Jesus is the Father. Now I can't open up the skull and force this mystery into it. I can only give it to you in words. But I'm telling you, the day is coming that you will have it as an experience. Your skull will explode and the drama begins to unfold within you. Everything said of Jesus Christ, you experience in the first person singular present tense. You are cast in the major role, and then you know who you are, yet you remain while in this world a very limited being because this is the world of mortality. There isn't a thing in this world that doesn't die. The stars are dying, the planets are dying, and everything here dies, everything dies. You came into the world of death to overcome it for the seed, that incorruptible seed had to fall into the earth and die to be made alive. So you and I came into this world with something hidden within us, which is the incorruptible seed, the seed known as the Christ seed. It is beholding the author of it all, transforming us into that image, because there's only God. When we are transformed into the image, then we are God. He can't beget another, he is begetting himself. While we're in this world, take it in this wonderful precept of his. Whatever you desire, believe that you have it, and you will. Mark 11, 24. No restriction placed upon the power of belief. None whatsoever. And he doesn't ask you to go and consult with a so-called holy man as to whether you should have it. He asks you to be the judge of what you want. Whatever you desire, believe that you have it, and you will. To the degree that you become self-persuaded that you have it, you'll get it. Because we're all one. And if it takes one million people in the world to aid the birth of that assumption, all right, 
it will take a million people. You will do it without their knowledge, without their consent. You don't have to ask anyone to aid you. They will aid you not knowing they are aiding you. All you are called upon to do is to assume that you have it. An assumption, though false, if persisted in, will harden into a fact. A Eden, that is the principle. So behind this fantastic play, where you are awakening as God, we have a secondary state in this world to cushion all the blows. So I am cast into the role of a poor man. But I have to meet Caesar's obligations. He demands taxes. He demands rent. He demands food. He demands this, and I need Caesar's coin. Well, whose coin is this? Caesar's. Well, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Well, how will I get it? Assume that you have it. Just assume that you have that which Caesar demands of you. He wants taxes. Well, assume that you have it. Let the world shake itself to pieces, and it will. And you will get whatever Caesar demands of you, if you dare to assume that you have it, and remain faithful to that assumption. But in it all, something else is taking place in you, which is infinitely greater than Caesar's world, for Caesar's world will come to an end. But the kingdom of heaven will not. That goes on forever, for this is life eternal, to know thee, the only true God, John 17, 3. So if I know the only true God, I am entering into an eternal life. To know Caesar's world is the world of death. But if I know the only true God, well, the only true God is my own wonderful human imagination. That's God. That is the eternal God. And he has a play to reveal it to me. Instead of saying in my words, my imagination is God. Which doesn't satisfy me. I want to know that this ancient script really is revealing it. Well, it tells me when you see David, he is going to call you father. When you see him, you will never see him until you are right, until that picture is perfect. Be ye perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Matthew 5.48 When you see David, it is because you've reached the end of the journey and he appears before you. You've played all the parts. You've been a thief. You've been a good man. You've been a known man and an unknown man. You've been everything in this world. When you come to the end of the journey and have played all the parts and the race is over, David stands before you. You are now the conqueror, and that crown is yours waiting for you, because now you are the father. If you are a father, where is my son? Here he comes, standing before you to prove that you are the father. He is God's son, and if he is your son, then who are you but God? Thou art my son today, I have begotten thee. Psalms 2.7 to whom did he say it? To David. And when David calls you father, then who are you but the one called God in the scripture? Seems so silly for a little man, one of billions in the world, to make these extravagant claims. But they are true. A little man went to the moon. He wasn't a big man. A little man conceived the idea of this energy today. His little name was Einstein. A little man. He's dead, but he conceived the idea and man believed to the extent of bringing billions to play upon his equation, and then they proved that he was right. So a little man walks the earth, but certainly he is not the one spoken of. It happens in the little man, for he is only wearing a mask. He isn't the little man. He is the God who created it, but he can't come into his inheritance until he takes off the little garment for the last time. So bring me the little child and put him into the midst of everyone and don't despise him, for he was the one who was with me in the beginning of time. When I laid out the foundations of the world, he was beside me as a little child. He was daily my delight, delighting me forever in the affairs of men. Proverbs 8.31 He who finds him finds life. He who misses him injures himself. He who hates him loves death. 8.35 That's the little child the little child is the symbol of you molding yourself into the image of the Father and casting yourself into these shadow worlds, playing certain parts as you mold yourself into the perfect image of the Father. When you are perfect so that you can radiate it and bear the very stamp of His nature, you are God the Father. At the end of these lectures, Neville would give two minutes of silence followed by questions and answers, as we will do now. Now let us go into the silence.
Are there any questions, please? Question. If, for example, he who came to your lectures, if we get so close to the truth and are exposed to it through your teachings in this part, I can't understand it. And to my own understanding, it seems almost kind of cruel for some still to be subject to pain and limitation and frustration. And then on the other hand, you say that everyone is cast in their role. I mean, it's almost like it doesn't matter anyway because it turns out all right. And if you're already cast in this role, it's almost inevitable that you're exposed to it, still knowing this. Neville says, no, my dear, as Paul said so beautifully in his eighth chapter of Romans, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. 818. Suffering, yes. This is the world of tribulation and death, and every child born, no matter how healthy it is, moves toward the inevitable gate of death. No matter what comes into this world, it dies. You buy a suit of clothes, and you think, now, isn't it lovely? And long before it wears out, it becomes horrible by the fashion of the day, and you will not be seen wearing it, even though you thought it was altogether wonderful when you bought it. Then fashions change rapidly today because of our economy and you would not be seen in it long before it actually wears it out, it wore out. And so bodies wear out. Every body that comes into this world, a little tiny child, such a lovely, healthy child, and if it lives to be a hundred, it will still wear out. Many around it, when it reaches a hundred, will wish it would die. The so-called loving grandchildren say, what's wrong with your grandfather? Why doesn't he die? His contribution is nil. And he's eating up the little that he has where we could use it. So what was seemingly in the beginning a lovely thought, wonderful to have him, he's productive, now he becomes not productive, and so he's using theirs. That's life. It's part of this world of decay. It it all adds to awakening as God. God fragmented and God gathered together into one being, yet without loss of your individual identity, like a brotherhood, a fabulous brotherhood, all making up one being, and the being is Father. So we are the sons, and yet we are the father. Question. I heard you years ago. I've read all your books, and one thing I don't understand, why did you have to stick with Jesus? After all, he was a sick boy. Bill says, you see, we have different concepts of what the word Jesus means. The word Jesus means Jehovah, the same thing. yod Hey vau Hey is Jehovah, the Lord. yod Hey vau shin Ayin is Joshua in Hebrew which is the same word as Jesus in the anglicized form. Well, people get off into the strangest concepts because of their background. Jehovah and Jesus are the identical names. If you take the root yod he vau he begins both. And the sacred name in the Hebrew world is yod he vau he which we pronounce Yehovah. Well, the root of the word is the root of Joshua. And Joshua is the Hebraic form of the anglicized form Jesus, same word. Question, well, there are two different characters, Jesus and Jehovah? Neville says, no, not if you understand the mystery. No, if one understood this great mystery, the Bible is not secular history. It has nothing to do with history in this world. It's a mystery to be understood only as it unfolds itself within the individual. The day will come that David, who you believe to be a historical character of a thousand BC will reveal himself to you as your own son and here you are in the 20th century. You preceded him if he is your son but David is not an individual born of a man called Jess. The word Jess is the same I am. Jess is any form of the verb to be. That's what the word Jess means. So I have found in David the son of Jess a man after my own heart. Acts 13.22 That's what Jess means. Well, if he's a father and I say I am, then I am the father. But I must wait until I actually know it. I could tell you from now till the ends of time that you are the father of David and that you are Jesus Christ. I could tell you that from now to the ends of time, but not till you've experienced it. Will you believe it? I don't have to believe it anymore. I have an assured I know. So the Hebrew world that is called the Old Testament and the New are the same. One of the most famous of all Jews, Disraeli, said Christianity is only the fulfillment of Judaism. 
That was Benjamin Disraeli, a brilliant, brilliant mind who understood what he was talking about. He understood the Hebrew tongue. He was a Jew and never denied it. But then he understood what the outcome of it was and not Christianity as taught in our churches. That is not Christianity. It hasn't a thing to do with Christianity. Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism, but not in a secular manner, in a supernatural manner, because Judaism is completely supernatural in manner. It is the foundation stone. As someone said, and wisely so, I am a Jew. Now he is born and raised in the Catholic faith. He became a priest, a very prominent priest in the Christian world, but he was born in the Catholic faith. He said, I am a Jew because I am a Christian. Now he said, I could be a Jew and not be a Christian, but I can't be a Christian and not be a Jew. How could I be a rose and not be the rose bush? I could be a rose bush without bearing roses, but I can't be a rose unless I came out of a rose bush. Christianity is only the flower coming out of the tree that is Judaism, but man is expecting a different kind of Messiah than that which comes. It comes within you and not from without. They are looking for some being coming from without that's going to save them. And you aren't saved from without. You are saved by fulfilling scripture. Scripture unfolds itself within you as your own wonderful biography. I'm not speculating. I'm telling you what I know from my own experience so everyone in this world will actually have the identical experience, everyone. And it's the Judeo-Christian faith, but not as practiced by either orthodox concepts. It hasn't a thing to do with any external worship, none whatsoever. To stick a little cross on the wall is nonsense. To stick a little Mogan David on the outside, that's nonsense. It's all within me. That's how it unfolds. But man is taught to believe that if I abide by a certain dietary rule, I'm building up a certain treasure in heaven. Building merit. Hasn't a thing to do with it. If I go to Mass, that's good for me. Hasn't a thing to do with it. If I buy all these little icons called saints like St. Christopher, who never existed, then that's good for me. All this is nonsense. The whole thing unfolds within man. Man is the book. Question. Will you discuss the relationship between the Old Testament B.C. and the New Testament A.D. and what it means? Neville says, That should be obvious to you. Here we have a revelation through men conditioned to receive an inner voice and hear an inner voice. They did not understand what they heard as told us in the Old Testament. Daniel said, I heard, but I did not understand. And then the voice said to him, close the book, seal the book, Daniel, until the end. You don't understand it, but write it carefully and don't try to change it, 12.4. Do not add to my words, put it down just as you heard it, 12.4.8. So he recorded that he heard all the Old Testament begins, and this is the vision of Isaiah, and this is the vision of Obadiah, this is the vision of Amos, their are visions. God makes himself known to man in vision as told us in the book of Numbers 12.6. So the Old Testament is the collection of the promises of God to man, but it takes time. It's like planting something and expecting it to grow overnight. It doesn't. It takes time to grow. The vision has its own appointed hour. It flowers, but just wait for it. Habakkuk 2.3. Eventually the whole thing will come into blossom and you will see the fruit of it. So when someone who is born a Jew, as we are told in scripture, I am born a Jew and I am telling you the truth concerning Judaism, he wasn't born outside the Jewish faith. Christianity began in the Jewish faith. All of the books of the New Testament are written by Jews. Paul said, I am of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Philippians 3.5 He was the one who wrote the first series of books of the Christian faith. That was Paul. His name was Saul changed into the name Paul. He told his own people what the words meant, but they would not believe him. He said, I'm telling you what the entire prophecy concerning the coming of Messiah means. He wasn't speaking of a being outside of himself called Jesus. He found him within himself and told the story. So it was so graphic, it changed BC into AD, a new age altogether. But this is still BC to everyone who hasn't had it. No one today Although we sign our letters 1969, that is 1969 AD, but not to the one who hasn't had the experience. It is marked from the one who has first had it and all those since. It is to them AD, 
but not to the billions that are living in this world. They are still living in BC, for they have not experienced Christ, so it's a convenience to put down 69, but not to the one who hasn't had it. I had the experience in 1959. I'm only 10 years in AD. Others will say, I'm 1969 AD, like fun they are. They are not in the world of AD until they have the experience. But the one who first had it was so graphic and unfolded the entire story that it marked the division between AD and BC. Everyone is living BC unless they have had the experience. Mine came in July 1959, so this coming month of July, it's been 10 years since I entered the New Age. So the whole vast world is still living before Christ, before the coming of Messiah, for he hasn't come to them. He is in them, but he hasn't awakened. If he hasn't awakened, then he hasn't come. Well, it's after the hour, and good night. And this concludes, the I in me is God himself. A long lecture with some really incredible questions and answers that gets to the core of Neville's teaching, understanding the division between I am and what it means, understanding the awakening Christ within is awakening as this God. But at the same time, we encounter a version of ourselves that is from humanity. A perfect version that comes through humanity that's symbolic called David and he explains this mystery the idea that the son is David and not Jesus and that Jesus is actually God himself awakening within us I just love Neville's interpretation of the Bible everything is personified even cities are personified Israel is a person everything is personified you are Israel Every city, everything that's in the Bible is you, and it's telling a story about you. And the idea is that the word erupts within you. When they say, I am the word, that's what they mean. For as Neville tells us in his lecture, The Living Word, the word in the written form is dead, and the letter kills, but the spirit makes it alive. And the spirit within us is a living word that comes to interpret the seeming dead letter. All the words, all the parts of the Bible are different states that we're entering into and are revealed within us as a living thing that adapts itself to your life. I'm not asking you to go out and read the Bible. I'm saying that it's already been written. You may be able to look back sometime and see that you've experienced all these things that are written of in the Bible. But each of us are going through this awakening of the Messiah within us that has gone through and sleeping this whole time, dreaming the world around us. But he always continually reminds us that while we are in this world, which he calls hell, referring to it as hell often, that as long as we take this principle that whatever we believe that we have received, we will receive it, that we are able to maneuver through this hell in a wonderful way. If we understand this concept and assume the reality that we want to see in our lives and assume the experiences that we want to experience in our lives these things become real and that is our little protection but the true idea behind what Neville is saying goes beyond just imagination and using your imagination to create reality or attract reality it is that you are God and you'll never know it until you truly experience it and when you experience it there's an eruption within where it comes from this I this I in you, which is God. And ultimately it is revealed that you are the God that created all things. And even though there's trillions and trillions of people on the earth, all of them are the I, including you. That is you. And you'll never know it. You'll never believe it until this thing happens within you in vision, in experience, in dream. Let me know if you've had the vision. Share your vision with us in the comments. The child. Have you had dreams of the child? Tell me what it was like. I want to hear everything. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.